Welcome, welcome. We're reading the Federalist Papers, okay? And we are in John Jay section still on page 16 towards the bottom. Let England have its navigation and fleet. Let Scotland have its navigation and fleet. Let Wales have its navigation and fleet. Let Ireland have its navigation and fleet. Let those four of the constituent parts of the British Empire be under four independent governments. And it is easy to perceive how soon they would each dwindle into comparative insignificance. Apply these facts to our own case. Leave America divided into thirteen, or if you please, into three or four independent governments. What armies could they raise and pay? It's interesting, California talks about how they want to branch off. So that would be, in John Jay's view, a disastrous decision. What fleets could they ever hope to have? So he's really raising the question of logistics and finances and, and uh, defense, right? If one was attacked, would the others fly to its succor and spend their blood and money in its defense? Would there be no danger of their being flattered into neutrality? Like, I like that word, flattered into neutrality. Think about that. Think about it. By precious promises or seduced by a too great fondness for peace to decline, hazarding their tranquility and present safety for the sake of neighbors, of whom perhaps they have been jealous, and whose importance they are content to see diminish. Look at that. Jealousy and happiness at the demise, wow, of their neighbors, wow. Although such conduct would not be wise, it would nevertheless be natural. So it's contending to the human nature and some of the follies we have. The history of the states of Greece and of other countries abound with such instances, and it is not improbable, that what has so often happened would, under similar circumstances, happen again. Ain't that the truth? But admit that they might be willing to help the invaded state or confederacy. How and when, and in what proportion, shall aids of men and money be afforded? Who shall command the allied armies, and from which of them shall he receive his orders? Who shall settle the terms of peace, and in case of such disputes, what umpire shall decide between them and compel acquiescence? Wow. He's really making the case for a unified force. Various difficulties and inconveniences would be inseparable from such a situation. Whereas one government, watching over the general and common interests and combining and directing the powers and resources of the whole, would be free from all these embarrassments and conduce far more to the safety of the people. So notice how he said, uh, if you're divided into confederate-type states, you know, you'll be seduced into uh, fondness for peace that actually will uh, make more chaos in the future. We flattered into neutrality. Instead, you need to combine your powers, pull your resources, and try to focus on the safety of the people. Interesting. But whatever may be our situation, whether firmly united under one national government or split into a number of confederacies, certain it is that foreign nations will know and view it exactly as it is, and they will act towards us accordingly. Interesting. So he's noticing, regardless of what system you're going to employ, other nations are going to be watching you. They're going to be examining you, seeing what's going on. If they see that our national government is efficient and well administered, our trade prudently regulated, our militia properly organized and disciplined, our resources and finances discreetly managed, our credit re-established, notice militia properly organized and disciplined, a government that's efficient. Right now we've seen a lot of, this virus has exposed how inefficient we truly are. And well administered, the payments again, the EDD payments and aid to those most needy is terrible. It's really terrible, especially for the homeless. Our trade prudently regulated. We let China get off with a lot and we take advantage of too many of their cheap products and flood the markets. And then with Mexico's avocados and corn, we kind of, we really do bring it to their disadvantage, especially for their small family farms. 
our resources and finances discreetly managed. Well, we just did a trillion dollar bailouts and a lot of it went to the corporates, to corporations. And uh, that's not good. Didn't really get to the small businesses. Our credit reestablished. We owe a lot in trade deficits, right? We owe a lot of money. We haven't really paid up on that yet. Are people free? Well, we have the highest prison population. Contented and united. We are not contented and united, especially with the police brutality. Los Angeles and Minneapolis are uh, showing how they're very unsatisfied with the systemic abuse. So we are fracturing at that point. They will be much more disposed to cultivate our friendship than provoke our resentment. So ideally, John Jay saying that if we had, you know, good credit, we discreetly managed our finances, we had a well-regulated militia, we were efficient in our administration and governments and such, uh, nations will want our friendship more than wanting to go against us. If on the other hand, they find us either destitute of an effectual government, each state doing right or wrong, as to its rulers may seem convenient, we kind of have that now. Look at the different states and how they're handling the virus and the death rates and, you know, Cuomo of New York sent sick patients back into old folks' home, which caused more people to get sick and infected, whereas Florida didn't have as much uh, stricter measures, but they're fine. It's just quite interesting. Or split into three or four independent and probably discordant republics or confederacies. One inclining to Britain, another to France, and a third to Spain, and perhaps played off against each other by three. What a poor, pitiful figure will America make in their eyes? How liable would she become not only to their contempt, but to their outrage? Ah, so he doesn't want America uh, to be seen contemptuous or outrageous. And how soon would dear bought experience proclaim that when a people or family so divided it never fails to be against themselves. Ah, so if you have all those things that he mentioned, you're going to even eat your own internal internal eating. Wow. His next essay is titled The Same Subject Continued by Don Jay. Queen Anne, in her letter of the 1st July, 1706, to the Scotch Parliament, makes some observations on the importance of the Union then forming between England and Scotland, which merit our attention. I shall present the public with one or two extracts from it. An entire perfect union will be the solid foundation of lasting peace. Look at that. Perfect union leading to a more solid and lasting peace. It will secure your religion, liberty, and property. Remove the animosities amongst yourselves and the jealousies and differences betwixt our kingdoms. It must increase your strength, riches, and trade, and by this union the whole island, being joined in affection and free from all apprehensions of different interests. Free from all apprehensions of different interests. Look at today, we have a lot of different political interests that are really causing a lot of discord, right? We'll be enabled to resist all its enemies. We most earnestly recommend to you calmness and unanimity in this great and weighty affair, that the union may be brought to a happy conclusion, being the only effectual way to secure our present and future happiness, and disappoint the designs of our and your enemies, who will doubtless on this occasion use their utmost endeavors to prevent or delay this union. Ah, so this letter... Queen Anne wrote to the Scotch Parliament is very relevant now and I can see why John Jay used it. Your enemies, if they see that you are not really secure and not really present in your happiness, you're not going to be able to resist the enemies and you're perfect for the plucking, right? It was marked in the preceding papers that weakness and divisions at home would invite dangers from abroad. Exactly. Exactly, and that nothing would tend more to secure us from them than union, strength, and good government within ourselves. This subject is copious and cannot easily be exhausted. <laughs> right? It can't, saying it cannot be exhausted means like you can't, stressing the importance will always need to happen and continue to happen. Right? This is very interesting. Solid foundation, lasting peace, perfect union, and having those your religion, liberty, and property 
will be more protected and secured under such a system. Definitely a good point. Definitely a good point. That's why it's important to read these historical texts because you can definitely see how today those what he's speaking of, how those issues he's talking about apply.